but the meta point that we're making here is that it's a useful task to try to reverse engineer how the market seems to be pricing itself. Uh, this doesn't mean we are hacking the bookmakers or torturing them or putting them under therapy to, or going through their garbage to figure out what they are doing. It's using the data that we have to try to figure out what is effectively being done. Not necessarily by the books per se, but by the market as a whole. So here's the example. You, you understand now what spreads are and money lines and over-unders, and of course you knew that before. There is also such a thing as alternative lines. So if you're looking at this game, the Bucks versus the Heat, the, the straight line, the minus two, with the minus 110 odds, means that the market effectively expects the Bucks will win the game by two points. And if you were to just go and bet the spread, you would either bet the minus two or you would bet the plus two. Both have uh, the same odds, minus 110. But what if you wanted to bet something a little different? What if you were willing to bet that Milwaukee will win not just by two, but by three, or maybe even by four, or maybe even by five? If you're willing to bet that the Bucks will win not just by two, but all the way by five, you're going to get much better odds. Instead of risking 110 to win 100, you're risking 100 to win 145. That's because it's less likely for the Bucks to win by five than to win by two. Is that clear? That's just what the alternative lines are, and you can choose. It's a menu. And these are all market prices. So as people buy and sell and trade, these numbers move around. They can seem a little bit arbitrary, but what we'll actually see is there's a certain coherence and logic to where they come from. So how are we, how are we going to do it? How are we going to figure out NBA alternative spreads? The main issue is, so we'd like to basically use historical data to try to understand a, a one particular live game. The problem is that all of our historical data is, in a sense, you could call it on market. We have the spread that actually existed for that game, the closing lines. And we know what actually happened, right? We don't have, let's suppose for now, maybe we could find one, but we don't have a database, a historical database of alternative lines for every game, right? We only have the closing spreads, the actual closing lines and the, and the actuals. So there's a bit of a disconnect. We're, here we're looking at one game with lots of different potential spreads, but our data set, our historical, is... The, the actual market spread that existed for that game. So how do we combine Almost, those things together? Uh, call this a success. Isn't this beautiful? Up to about plus one, this is a really good match. This is a really good match. And it's just using the historical data from three years ago, 2018, 2009, two years ago, to explain the alternative lines from the current year, from, from one current game in the current year. But now we have two other problems. One is this gap. Now maybe this gap is not so bad. It's a little hard to eyeball because if you get rid of this jump, then it kind of moves together. But we'll see. This jump is the problem. What is this jump? It goes from one to minus one. When we go from one to minus one, suddenly our decimal odds are crazy again. Why? This is where the, you know, if you're doing quantitative sports betting, there's the betting part, which is don't get kicked out, all that practical stuff. There's the quantitative stuff, which is what we did. But let's not forget the sports part. This is basketball. What do we know about basketball? Games can't end in ties. Maybe once it's happened, I don't know. But basically, games cannot end in ties. So if a game goes from... If a team outperforms, it was expected to win by three, and it ended up winning by one, it outperformed by two points. Would you agree? It outperformed by two points. If it was expected to lose by seven, but it only lost by five, again, it outperformed by two points. But if it was expected to lose by one, and it actually won by one, it didn't really outperform by two points, did it? Because you can't end at zero. It really only outperformed by one point. There's a hump at that zero. That's not really a win, right? That's something we have to adjust for. Now that's, How do we adjust? That's almost perfectly beautiful, isn't it? 
There's still a little bit of ugliness here, but the kink is basically gone. We match a lot of the way. We could, we could declare victory. Um, for now, let's declare temporary victory and go back to our the way we were thinking about doing things. So we've compared the fitted price with the market. It looks pretty good. So one right? benefit of the empirical distribution is that up till now, we've made pretty much no assumptions or very few assumptions on the data on how the MBA spreads behave. You might want to ask yourself, what assumptions have we made? Well, one assumption that we've made is that the data that we use, which was from 20, which was from the pre-COVID season, 2018, 2019, one assumption we've made is that, that that data is relevant for the game that we happen to be analyzing. Okay, But beyond that, we've pretty much made no assumptions. So that's good. We're not putting too much structure into the data. We're not assuming too much. But we might be assuming too little. One of the drawbacks of empirical distribution is that it's prone to noise due to small sample sizes. We can see that in the example of these dice that we're rolling you know, 20, 30 times. We get the histogram. It doesn't look, it doesn't match the theoretical histogram perfectly. So there's naturally going to be random variation in the data. And the smaller our sample, the more, ran, the more prone to variation it is. So sometimes we want to put some assumptions on, but we don't want to put too many on. Okay, so there's a fine line, and this is where some of the art of data analysis comes in, is how much do we trust the data and just use the data empirically, and how much do we want to smooth out these rough patches? Basketball is a great situation for using the Gaussian because there's so many possessions in a game, and during most of those possessions, or a lot of those possessions, points get scored. So over the course of an entire game, the, the, the random variation tends to even out, tends to, tends to really even itself out and smooth itself out so that the behavior that we see in final scores of basketball games does tend to look pretty close to the Gaussian distribution. So the Gaussian distribution is determined by its expected value, which is the center of the distribution. How many points do we expect to be scored? What is the differential we expect? And how much spread or how much deviation we expect around that, around that expected value. So here in the normal distribution, we see this is one standard deviation from the mean, plus or minus. This is two standard deviations from the mean. And if I were to draw a third standard deviation, I would cover up pretty much the entire distribution. It would almost all of the probability in a Gaussian distribution falls within plus and minus three standard deviations of the, of the mean. So that's something to be aware of. That may not be a good, a good behavior or a good property that we want for, for a lot of or certain situations that we find embedding, but for the purposes of our NBA alternative spreads example, this is the histogram underneath. Here I've, I've overlaid a normal distribution, and we can see that this normal distribution looks pretty close to the shape. It follows the shape of the histogram pretty well. Main difference being that this spike here around a little, a little bit past zero, we might ask, is that is that something, is that a real phenomenon or is that just random variation? Okay, so that's something for us to consider. But what we want to do is we want to think, well, maybe this Gaussian distribution is a good thing for us to use because we saw that the empirical distribution can have these rough patches and we don't want our analysis to be arbitrarily um, affected by these random variation in the data. So. If we can make a reasonable assumption and we can smooth out some of those rough patches, Let's maybe we can get a better. Does if I hit it, seventy-four. If we copy paste this down, what happens to our beautiful chart? All we're changing is going from the empirical, our first approach, to now this normal approach, and da 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 da, great victory, wonderful success. Look at this amazing thing. You saw what it was before, right? I could do a little undo action. This is what it was before. Can I do a redo? I can't do a redo. Thanks, Excel. But we can copy paste down. Now it lines up. The kink is gone. It works through here. There's no kink. It continues working. Harry's still not going to be happy, right? Because he sees these things and he's like, this is amateur hour, right? It's still not perfectly matched. But we're getting somewhere, aren't we? We wanted to reverse engineer the book and this is at least something. Like this is very, very promising.
All right, so let's wrap up with, with a summary of what we learned here. It's a bit of a roller coaster ride. We, we see that in the MBA, the empirical distribution at first fit okay, but we did much better with the Gaussian. But in the NHL, the Gaussian isn't going to do anything for us. We had to go to the empirical. We had to get creative. So we learned that there's no one-size-fits-all approach. It's not about learning a bunch of tools and just plugging them in. It's about learning the thought process, having a clear way of thinking about uh, what we're doing in order to um, in order to tackle new challenges as they come up. Right. We saw a lot of anomalies, and we encountered anomalies. Right. The kink in the NBA. Uh, example, we fixed it. NHL scoring tendencies, the odds versus the evens. There's always going to be anomalies in the data, and the difference is going to be between the anomalies we can account for, the ones that we can address, and the ones that we don't understand. And there's always a question of, are those anomalies that we don't understand, is that because of something we're missing, something that the market knows that we don't, or is that something due to random variation? that um, you know, is just part of the fact that we have a limited sample size, we have limited information, or is it something else? Okay, so we always have to be aware of the possibility that our model is missing a piece of information that the market is pricing in. So we shouldn't rush to believe our models. When do we know? I mean, the, 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 the big question, when do we know when we found an edge? 